All right, so now we've got the equilibrium concept under our belts. One last thing we'll look at is what happens when the equilibrium process is interrupted by forces that artificially keep markets from attaining equilibrium. There are two major categories to consider here. Forces that keep prices artificially low, thus resulting in consistent shortages of a good, and forces that keep prices artificially high, resulting in consistent surpluses of a good. The forces of demand and supply in a free market are swift and powerful, so it usually takes some kind of external force, such as a law that either prevents price changes or holds prices at an arbitrary level, to cause persistent non-equilibrium outcomes. Let's look at some examples of these price controls and the predictable sad effects they have for the functioning of markets and human welfare. We'll start with price ceilings. Price ceilings are laws that hold prices at or below a specified level by making it illegal for sellers to charge higher prices for the good in question. An infamous example of price ceilings in action was the price controls on gasoline in the U.S. in the 1970s. For most of this decade, actual equilibrium market prices of gas in the U.S. bounced around below the ceiling level, so the price control did not matter. But there were a few occasions during which market forces wanted to push the price above the ceiling level, but couldn't. As we say in econ jargon, the ceiling became binding. Specifically, there were two big negative supply shocks in the oil market associated first with the OPEC supply restrictions in 1973-1974 and the Iranian crisis of 1979-1980. What happened? Well, instead of the price rising naturally and swiftly to a new higher equilibrium, thus inducing buyers to cut back on lower valued uses of gasoline, you know, maybe people would carpool more, people would be induced to take the bus more, and so on and so forth, and inducing the oil industry to ramp up oil exploration and production efforts, the price became a non-equilibrium price and gas shortages cropped up across the country. And you can see how this plays out in the graph. Gas lines became the norm because people were prevented from spending extra money to demonstrate their valuation of gasoline. They resorted to spending extra time. Perversely, those who valued their time lowest would often wound up getting more gas than they truly needed because they were more able to wait in line. Those who valued both their time and gasoline very highly, for example, say an on-call emergency doctor, often went without gas because they could not afford to waste time waiting in long gas lines. One other outcome was that gas stations might try to stretch their low gas supplies by reducing the quality of gas they sold. Other workarounds like bribery and black market gasoline sales became commonplace as well, although these aren't nearly as efficient or effective as free markets and they open up their own cans of worms on legal and ethical grounds. Fortunately, the U.S. government wised up and ended gasoline price controls completely in 1981. Although, sadly, many U.S. states retain a version of price controls on gasoline and other goods in the form of price gouging laws. An example of the uh, detrimental effect of price gouging laws occurred when Hurricane Sandy hit the U.S. East Coast in November of last year. Price gouging laws prevented the price from rising in the face of an adverse supply shock, and we saw a repetition of the 1970s oil crisis effects, people waiting in long gas lines on the East Coast. And sadly, people sometimes resorted to desperate and dehumanizing tactics to purchase gasoline because they were prevented from paying higher money prices. This is what can happen when you implement price controls. One final comment on price ceilings. You might be wondering why politicians would continue to enact price ceilings, especially since both economic theory and recent economic history prove that they don't work, they make matters worse. This is a mystery. My own view is that since very few people have a deep understanding of economics, politicians can score easy points with the public by promising to keep prices low on things that everyone buys, like gasoline. But now that you're economically informed, you should know better. Low prices are not the result of a politician's diktat, but rather favorable supply conditions. When supply conditions suddenly become unfavorable, 
from the consumer's point of view, as they did for gasoline in the 1970s oil shocks, or briefly on the U.S. East Coast in 2012 with Hurricane Sandy, prices must be allowed to rise to maintain market equilibrium and ensure that gains from trade, although diminished somewhat due to the heightened scarcity after the supply shock, continue to be maximized in these markets. If you want gasoline prices to be lower, and therefore consumer surplus in the gasoline market to be greater, you should pursue policies that reduce the long-run cost conditions of oil production. Examples of such supply-side policies for oil would include opening more land to oil drilling, or maybe more offshore drilling, reducing the tax and regulatory burden on oil producers, reducing gasoline taxes, subsidizing gasoline purchases, or subsidizing alternative motor fuels like ethanol or natural gas, which would reduce oil demand and therefore the price of oil. And by the way, I'm not necessarily endorsing any of these policies. This all might have their uh, pros and cons. But these are just some examples of policies that could lead to lower gas prices rather than just creating shortages and frustration in dehumanizing workarounds like the price ceilings on gasoline have done. As one more example on the effects of price control, I want to share with you a five minute video from Prager University that assesses the impact of price controls on apartment units or rent control. Now note that this is not pure economics now, this is an applied economics, so value judgments are brought in. You might sense here that the presenter is basing the analysis on the value judgment that government policies designed to help low-income people have more affordable housing ought to actually help low-income people have more affordable housing. So I don't think it's too controversial a value judgment and the economic analysis is relatively straightforward. Do price controls on apartments, rent controls, actually work? Let's take a look. There's no hot button issue hotter than rent control. Even the most courageous politician quakes at the idea of opposing it. For starters, no one likes landlords. What? Second, those who benefit from rent control, and there are a lot of them, vote. And it has huge emotional appeal. Imagine the six o'clock news story. A reporter interviews a senior citizen, describing how she'll have to vacate her small apartments, her home for 25 years, if her rent control isn't maintained. What politician wants to go up against that? These are just a few of the reasons why. Once a city adopts rent control, it's almost impossible to dislodge it. But does rent control work? Does it lower or raise housing costs? And does it increase the building of more affordable housing? It might surprise you to know that nearly all economists on the right and the left, from the late Milton Friedman to Paul Krugman, agree that the answer is no. In a survey of 464 economists in the May 1992 issue of American Economic Review, 93% said that a ceiling on rents reduces the quantity and quality of housing available. Why the unanimity? because it's an accepted economic principle that government-imposed price controls, and that's what rent control is, always lead to price distortions, in this case, rents. This applies everywhere, but let's focus on New York City, the place where I have concentrated my research. New York has the biggest rental market in the country. Of the city's 8.2 million residents, five and a half million rent. And these five and a half million renters live in about 2.2 million apartments or rented houses. Every year, a city board votes on how much owners of rent regulated apartments will be able to charge their tenants for the following year's one year or two year leases. The board members base their decisions not on supply and demand, but on an estimate of how much costs such as fuel and insurance have risen. And of course, how much of an increase voters will tolerate. Think about what this means. The longer you stay in your apartments, the more you benefit from below market rents. Or to put it another way, why would you ever leave your rent controlled apartments? The late screenwriter Nora Ephron once noted with some satisfaction that she moved into a five bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side in 1980 
and stayed there for 24 years, paying one-third the true market rent. The well-off who benefit from great rents have the resources, in part from the money they've saved on rents, to make their own improvements to their units, paint, redecorate, and so on. But what about the majority of renters who have much less money? They're not so lucky because landlords can't afford to improve or even maintain their rent-controlled apartments. Since they can't raise rents to market levels, they can only make a profit by keeping their costs to an absolute minimum. And there's another reason landlords have little incentive to maintain rent-controlled apartments. They have no fear that their renters will move out. And if they do, there's always a long line of people waiting to move in. And consider one more unintended consequence of rent control. Why would investors build new apartments for anyone but the very wealthy in a city where rents are controlled? The answer, of course, is that they rarely do. The vast majority of new residential construction in New York is geared to the wealthy who can pay rents above the controlled limit or who are willing to buy their apartments outright as condos or co-ops. These expensive units are well beyond the reach of the middle class, let alone those lower on the economic stratum. In sum, rent control, one, hurts the people it's supposed to help. Two, give landlords little incentive to improve their housing stock. Three, discourages construction of new housing for all but the rich. And the voters love it. So rather than dream of the day when New York or Los Angeles and other rent-controlled cities might abandon this self-destructive urban policy, maybe we should see this as a cautionary tale that well illustrates a valuable maxim. Be wary of government programs bearing gifts. Like the famous horse that destroyed an ancient city, they come with all sorts of problems. I'm Nicole Gelinas, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. Okay, finally, let's take a look at price floors. Now, these are laws that hold the price at or above a specified level by making it illegal for sellers to engage in transactions of the good below this price. Fortunately, there aren't many examples of price floors in today's economy. This kind of price control is so obviously against the interest of consumer welfare that it tends to not be very popular with voters or the politicians that represent them. However, there is one glaring example here where, because the mass of voters tend to be producers of this good themselves, it is a popular policy to set a minimum price. We're talking, of course, about the price floor on labor services, the minimum wage. As a price floor on labor, we predict that the minimum wage will cause a surplus of labor, known in economics as unemployment, and a reduction of total surplus in some labor markets. Fortunately, the vast majority of workers in the U.S. earn well more than the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. According to the St. Louis Fed, average hourly earnings were just under $20 per hour in the U.S. in 2012. Therefore, the minimum wage is a non-binding price control for most American workers. The workers most affected by the minimum wage would be those who do not have a high market value to begin with. So when considering the impact of the minimum wage, we'll want to look at low-value workers, that is, workers without much job experience or education, for whom the minimum wage may well be a binding constraint. In other words, for unskilled, uneducated workers, the minimum wage forces them to charge employers more than their equilibrium wage, more than they are worth in the job market. Who are these unskilled, uneducated workers? Can't find my checkbook. Hope you don't mind, I pay you in change. Six dollars. It's like a dollar an hour. Almost by default, younger workers, especially teenagers, tend to be concentrated in this category. Youths often have very little or zero work experience, and having not completed college or perhaps even high school, they have little education as well. There's lots of companies out there who might be willing to hire these young people in large numbers to do simple, low-skilled tasks like cleaning toilets, uh, basic service labor. But the companies are going to be prevented by the legal requirement to pay them more than their true market value. 
Think about it. When you're forced to pay more than you know a good is worth, do you buy more or less of it? So we predict that the minimum wage causes a surplus of certain kinds of workers, again, namely unskilled, uneducated workers, most of whom are younger folks, and in economics, a persistent surplus of labor is known as unemployment. Again, we'll trace out the effects in the graph. There are some workers out there with very little skill and experience, again, who might only have a true market value of, say, $5 an hour. For these workers, the minimum wage is going to force them to charge a price that's higher than they're worth, at least $7.25 an hour. At this higher price, quantity supplied by the young workers, of course, is going to be much larger than the quantity demanded by companies who might be willing to hire them. This generates a surplus of the good, and again, a surplus of labor is known as unemployment. It's going to reduce consumer surplus of the companies that might otherwise hire these workers. It's going to shift producer surplus, possibly reducing it, possibly actually increasing it for a few workers, but reducing it for others. One thing we can be sure of is that a surplus in this labor market will generate unemployment amongst this worker category. And as evidence of this unemployment effect, let's take a look at the youth unemployment rate relative to the overall unemployment rate. Most recently, the U.S. teen unemployment rate stood at 23.5%. This is for 16 to 19-year-olds versus the overall unemployment rate for the entire population of 7.8%. Here's some data going back for the last 10 years. Notice that while both the unemployment rates tend to fluctuate with the overall business cycle, both of the rates went up in the 2008-2009 recession. The teen unemployment rate is consistently about three times higher than the overall unemployment rate for the general population. Does this have anything to do with the minimum wage? Most economists say yes. This is a sad but predictable effect of a price floor on unskilled labor. Okay, well that about wraps it for our look into equilibrium, the market process, and the effects of price controls. One thing I want you to keep in mind, a big lesson we learned from economics, and this is a has important public policy implications is that price controls don't work. Markets need to be at equilibrium to accomplish maximum gains from trade and efficiency.